Hello and thanks for joining me. Well, it's about time I did another Ask Me Anything because I have had a few questions in the comments which I've replied to by saying I'll cover it in an Ask Me Anything. So as a matter of courtesy, it's about time I did something about it. Now, I know these particular sorts of videos aren't to everybody's taste. So if this isn't for you, please, I won't be offended. Move on and join me next time when I'll be out and about taking pictures. Anyway, if you're still with me, let's get to a few questions, starting with this one. Right then, I think I'll answer this first question with a practical demonstration. So let's pretend I really want an image of this old pigsty in my yard. This first question comes from Ken Rees. Now, Ken has been following me for quite some time uh, and often comments on my videos, and I really appreciate that. Thanks ever so much, Ken. Uh, Ken asks this, I've noticed you never handhold your camera and that you will use a tripod. Are there any conditions you will handhold your camera? Because I seldom use a tripod, I find moving about a lot gives me more scope and it's one less item to carry. Well, Ken, that's a really good point. And in an ideal world, I suppose I'd probably not want to carry a tripod either. Um, but because I have to, for a number of reasons that I'll come on to in a moment, what I did was, even though it's quite a cheap tripod off of Amazon, about 45 quid, it's also the lightest one I could find at only just over a couple of pounds. It's done me really well for about the last 18 months or so. So it's not really too much of a problem to carry it with me, even when I'm doing a really big hike up a high ridge or something. But the first thing I'd say about using a tripod is that there are times when I don't use a tripod. And in fact, in my last video, uh, you'll see that was one of those very times. But what I've usually done by the time you see me talking to you when my camera's on a tripod is I've already done a lot of moving about. I've already walked backwards and forwards, left and right, and up and down. Um, in other words, I'm like a three axis gimbal. So by the time it goes on the tripod, I've kind of got a good idea of where I'm going to want it. And at that point, the tripod really is just somewhere to park it. Because I usually want to think about my exposure. I want to maybe ever so slightly recompose. The likelihood is, though, I'm going to think about it for some time. And by parking it on a tripod as close to the final composition as I can get it, I don't have to then memorise, well, where was I standing when I saw that particular composition that I wanted. Um, and of course, I might well then put some filters on it uh, and generally think about what I'm up to. So that's the first thing. Now, the second thing as far as using a tripod is, of course, there are times when you can only do what I do with a tripod. That might be a focus stack, an exposure bracket, a long exposure. There are quite a few different techniques that landscape photographers will use a tripod for. And there's one final reason why more often than not, my main camera is on a tripod. What I tend to do is when I'm describing to you or to you over there, what I'm up to with the main camera and the composition that I'm working on, I'll often be filming through this camera so that when I talk to you about it, you can see what I'm seeing and you can understand what I'm on about. Or I could pop round in front of my main camera like this to talk about whatever it is over my shoulder. And while I'm doing that, I will often be recording the audio onto here. So it's really handy to have this camera on a tripod while I do that. When I'm back in post, I'll often just split the audio off this particular uh, segment and sync it up with this camera over here when I'm chatting to you or to you way over there sitting on top of the pigsty. So hopefully that answers your question, Ken, and thank you ever so much for asking. Now the next one comes in from Philip Culbertson. Philip's written in before and he asked me why I didn't do my Ask Me Anythings when I'm out and about. Um, that's a good question because the last time I did and this time I'm not. It has as much to do with the fact that the weather's terrible and it's really difficult to just sit and talk when it's blowing a gale. So bear with me while I do one or two indoors until it picks up in the summer, in which case I'd be more than happy to be outdoors. So Philip asks, 
Uh, my question for the future is, how do you plan your shoots? Are they completely spontaneous or do you have a list of places and conditions that you want to cover uh, to match up your time? Do you decide the day before what to shoot, etc.? Okay, um, the short answer is mostly I choose where I'm going to go usually no more than 48 hours before I go. The advantage I've got over many other photographers is that all of the fabulous locations that I have around me are all within a maximum of about 30 minutes drive. What that allows me to do is to look at what the weather's going to be doing, the tides are going to be doing, and also if I've done a couple of vlogs in the mountains, I'll probably do the next one on the coast anyway, just to mix things up a little bit. But it's very much a case of lastminute.com and sometimes I even just look out my window and decide where I'm going within the next hour or two. So it, it really is quite spontaneous. I suppose the advantage that I have, Philip, is that I've got uh, pretty good knowledge of all the sort of places that I'm likely to want to go. So I kind of know what marries up with what conditions, particularly with tides. Um, the weather tends to be a bit more generic, uh, but quite a lot of the coastal locations that I cover are very heavily influenced by tides. So the last question for this one is from Alan Coles. Firstly, let me say, Alan, thank you ever so much. Alan's been one of my longest term supporters. He's been commenting on my videos since, I don't know, about number five or something like that. So I really appreciate that sort of long term support. Um, we are desperately trying to organise a get together at some point in the not too distant future. So hopefully we'll get a day out together in the mountains. Anyway, Alan asks about the colours that I'm getting from my new Olympus system as opposed to my old Nikon system. He's noticed that it sort of looks more natural, less saturated perhaps. Um, and actually, Alan, the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely. What I found is the palette is much more subtle on this Olympus and almost if I push the colours as I used to a little bit with a Nikon, they now just don't look right with the Olympus. I much prefer that sort of desaturated look. Um, somebody who's processing, I've always really quite liked, is Jason Jones's. Now, Jason uses Canon, but his effect is, is very desaturated where it's the right thing to do. If he's got a real interesting coloured sky, he won't desaturate that or at least I don't think he does. He'll probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always admired his processing style. And with the sort of raw files I've been getting off this Olympus, I found it easier to emulate because straight out of camera, they just look better. Um, I'm sure that it was that I had a real entry level Nikon sensor in my old camera. I'm sure if I was shooting with an 800 series full frame, I might've felt differently about it. But yeah, it is different and I quite like it. Actually, I really like it. I'm very pleased with this new system. I'll be doing a full, probably three month review of it. And then that's the last I'll ever talk about equipment because my channel really isn't about equipment. So, uh, Alan, thank you very much for that question. So that's about it for today. Um, one thing I did want to say quickly before I sign off is that I've been asked quite a lot of other questions, but they're much more about very specific technicalities. Um, things like processing, uh, exposure techniques, all sorts of quite specific, how do you do this? How do you approach that sort of questions? Not really appropriate for an ask me anything. I'd steered away from doing post-processing and technical stuff. Uh, but since people are asking, I'm actually going to cover it in very, very quick, simple terms. I'm not going to go into lengthy technical how-to sort of videos. But over the next few months, every now and then, I'm just going to chuck in one that answers a question that I've been asked. Again, because it's only fair to the people that bother to write in and ask. Um, and at the end of the day, if it's not something you're interested in, not a problem at all. There'll be another video along shortly, which hopefully you will be interested in. So I'll be covering things like how I do focus stacking, how I do exposure blending, that sort of thing. Um, and also an overview of my post-processing workflow, which is quite a bit different to the sort of thing you might have seen elsewhere on YouTube. Um, 
So uh, yeah, if you're interested in those sort of things, keep an eye on the channel. They'll just be coming up every now and then. One thing really important, these are not going to be videos where I say, this is how you should do focus stacking. This is how you should do exposure blending. Not in the slightest. What these are going to be are, this is how I do focus stacking and how I do exposure blending. It could be completely wrong and people who know a lot better than I do are very welcome to write in and point out my failings because I'm always really, really eager to learn and improve. Anyway, listen, I think we'll leave it there for this one. Thank you ever so much for joining me. As always, I really appreciate your encouragement and support. And if you haven't done it yet, why not subscribe now and join me next time. Cheers.